so Nick, as we get close to the end here, something that you have recently done, which uh, is just incredible. And I, I have seen the movie, but you have a very, I mean, a pretty big part in the end sequence of Killers of the Flower Moon, the recent Martin Scorsese movie with um, Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, a bunch of other actors are in it. Tell us about that experience, man. What what happened? And then maybe talk about your scene. Yeah, um, it all started um, with um, an email to my website, uh, which is not that often. I, if you're out there, I encourage you to email me and say hi, because I get like three emails per year on my website. It was just a very polite email that said, you know, you know we're making a movie. Um, I think they had the name of the movie in there, but you know, we're making a, a movie in, in Oklahoma and my job is to find uh, props for the film. And we're in need of these vintage sound effect instruments uh, for the film. And if you're interested in either selling or renting them, you know, please let us know. And it was just very cut and dry, very polite. And uh, the, the crazy part of the story is that I didn't really think much of that email. I, I was biased. I said, I don't think they make very big important movies in Oklahoma actually now now I learned now that they've made several uh just yeah. just lately but I, I thought like it can't be a real serious movie if it's kind of like made in Oklahoma uh, maybe it's a small student film I don't know I don't know who these people are and um I didn't respond to the email <laughs> oh boy so um I, I think I, I I planned to eventually but I didn't respond right away. And, and 48 hours later, um, they emailed again and they said, hi again, Nick. Like, we really hope that you um, um, found our last email. Uh, again, the movie is called Killers of the Flower Moon. And uh, please get back to us. And so I said, okay, let's, let's, it sounds like an obscure name when you first hear it. Yeah. And so I said, okay, let's Google search, you know, the name of this movie. And the first thing that pops up is Robert De Niro and, Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese's face. Oh my God. Probably, <laughs> and, oh boy. I, I, like, I, was, I was in my car. I was like, Oh my God. I, I immediately replied. Um, yeah. And they were very nice about it. Um, everything was super humble. Um, they didn't say we're big hot shots or anything like that. Um, so my first contact was a guy who was just looking for props. And um, the more I got into talk with him and, and with, um, some of the producers, um, I was basically saying, you know, I don't really rent out these instruments um, for anyone else's use. And um, if you want the instruments, your best bet is to hire me to play them on screen, uh, which is a very brave move on my part just to be like, yeah. cast me. But it's true. Um, yeah. It was true. I, if, you, if you're going to have somebody uh, playing these instruments, um, it would be really difficult for me to teach an actor to play these instruments. Um, so why not just use me? And they told me, okay, uh, send photos of all four sides of your body, toe to head. And it would be great if you could get those to us in the next half an hour. We're going to show them to Marty. And I was like, yep. that Marty? And the big mark. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is all in my memory, but I'm, I'm pretty positive. That's what they, they said. And it sounds right. Terrified me. And, uh, I dressed up in a suit. <laughs> I was telling my wife to how to hold the camera. Oh, don't hold it like that. I was, it's for Marty. I was sweating. <laughs> they told me do this in half an hour. We had to move our kitchen table so that we had like a backdrop, like a clean wall as a backdrop. Um, and we were just running around like crazy. And um, I sent them the four pictures of all sides of me, and I didn't hear back for a grueling like three days. And I was thinking, oh man, they maybe they don't like that I'm like losing my hair or something. I, <laughs> it was making me feel really bad about myself. Like, oh, is oh, something uh, about yeah. my appearance like I'm sure not 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 good enough or something? But oh. um, that, that's just. A me issue that you know oh, everyone no, goes through. Every right? guy, everyone has. And yeah. as a musician, we're not used to our uh, appearance being judged for something. You know, we're just used to yeah. you know how do you play? Um, so they got back 
And um, there's a voicemail on my phone uh, that I saved that says, you know, all the details. And then it says, well, it sounds like you're going to be a cast member in the film. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I was just I jumping up and down. I was working at a, a swim school just to get by at that time. Yeah. And I had to run back to my classes and just take a break to hear this voicemail. And it was the most obscure thing. I ran out of, you know, I, during my 10 minute break, I would talk to a producer from London <laughs> and then go back to teaching a four year old how to swim. It was very <laughs> obscure. And the true Hollywood uh, um, kind of story right there. Wow. The hard thing about um, doing something like this, um, pre-production like two years before anyone will see it is that people think you're crazy i had to tell my boss you know there's someone from a movie calling me and they'd be like oh all right all right <laughs> whatever man <laughs> and for the longest time i was telling people that you know i'm going to be in a martin scorsese movie and they were like all right no nick got hired to like you know ride a bicycle in the background somewhere you know you know yeah. i've heard a story like that before it wasn't until I think 2022 in February that we filmed it and it, it got delayed a lot. This was during COVID and um, they had originally flown me out. Uh, this is the cool thing about big budget things. They, um, they mentioned that, you know, if you're going to be in the thirties, you can't have a buzz cut. I had a buzz cut at the time and they said, uh, we well, are going to have to try on different wigs for you. Um, and they, they say things that only movie people say. They're like, um, you know, how's tomorrow? Can we fly you out in the morning tomorrow? <laughs> and I didn't fly out in the morning tomorrow, but uh, they flew me out right away. And um, they had a rental car ready for me at the airport to drive to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, where they just had this huge caravan of trailers. And they were filming the movie in what looked like 1900s early 1900s aircraft hangars made out of brick I, sound stages basically yeah they, they, they had turned wow. aircraft hangars into sound stages and um i sat with a really nice lady who was uh, her name was Kay, who was trying on different wigs with me and they were going to fly me out on the same day fly me in fly me out and so uh she was frantically trying to find you know, uh, hair pieces to put on me <laughs> that fit. And that, that was a whole issue. They, uh, they have to measure your head by putting saran wrap on your head and taping the saran wrap. And I was only there for a few hours. So they, um, had the entire props team, which is like seven people around me interviewing me with questions about different sound effect. What is this? Is it, oh, it's a train whistle. Okay. All right. They had a binder with photos from my website being like, all right, oh, what, what sound does this make? Would that be used in radio days? Oh, okay. All right. You know, and I, because it was only two hours and it was lunchtime, they also had me eating. <laughs> they brought me like this beautiful <laughs> salmon to eat. Wow, and so I'm head having wrapped in saran wrap, my, head, salmon. my head's wrapped in saran wrap. I'm eating salmon. And there's like a team of people who I'm just meeting for the first time. Like, barraging me with detailed questions and then Showbiz, jump baby jump in a rental car and fly back it was like it was crazy um wow. so it was delayed and delayed delayed again so they said okay just grow your hair out and we'll comb it like the 30s so the wig was never <laughs> needed um but uh it, it turned out to be a great story um yes, yes. so um Without being too long, um, we filmed the radio scene in uh, Martin Scorsese's high school, which was a Catholic high school in the Bronx, Cardinal Hayes High School. And um, they chose it because it had a convincingly 1930s, 1940s stage. Hmm. And um, they built the sound booth for the radio engineers. They brought in original ribbon microphones from the RCA era. And um, they dressed us all, of course. And yep. um, we had spent months on Zoom meetings with the production team to design a 1930s radio studio that would look realistic. Not mm -hmm. just a bunch of props scattered around. They wanted it to look really authentic. 
And you're like a consultant. You're not yeah. just a guy standing there pretending to like play a trumpet or whatever. Or, or I mean, it sounds like they're they actually they are real musicians in this case. But mm-hmm. you are beyond just a actor performer. You are a consultant. Yes, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not credited as one, but I was consulting. We were doing Zoom meetings, and yep. um, so we we designed that scene. Uh, we rehearsed at Steiner's studio. Steiner Studios in Brooklyn. And um, that was the first time that Scorsese came in and, and he, you know, came up and um, he came up to me and we, we met, we shook hands and um, he just started pointing to instruments on the table, demonstrate that. What sound does that make? Um, incredibly detailed for a director making a three and a half hour movie to, yeah. to care about like, what sound does, does this make? What, what sound does that make? All right. Oh, interesting. Uh, is that period correct? You know, really great questions. And um, there was another sound effect man as well, who was actually a modern day Foley artist. So he had the skills, uh, but I was teaching him a little bit. And uh, one of the funnier things is like my coffee grinder, um, the, uh, the car imitation. He was like, oh, play that for me. And he goes, ah, sounds a little bit like a, like a projector to me. <laughs> he was just, just kind of like, you know, yeah, making, making these, uh, you know, observations about these sounds and whether they sounded sure. real or not, which is really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. we rehearsed it and we, um, we filmed it with these, um, some props were made. Um, they had a giant wooden gravel pit, which was not only made, but made to look old and aged and stained and scuffed up to look like it was used filled with like gravel for fully for fully like walking more of a something. Foley type of thing. And they yeah. use that in radio a lot. And we had sent photos from books of, of exactly what you should make it look like. And, um, it was cut from the movie, but there was a scene of me, uh, with huge manacle chains on my hands, stomping in the gravel, trying to sound like a prisoner in a prison yard. And, um, other, another cool prop that I actually made, because if you haven't noticed, um, I have silent film stuff and this is radio. And so they used a couple of these things in the radio era, but I also had to make things radio era. They, they were making more things at home back then. Um, they, they had space and resources. So I made, um, a doorbell with a doorbell battery. And, um, I found online, they actually make, um, replica batteries from the thirties and it's filled with D batteries, but it, on the outside, it looks like a 1930s battery. I got the old cloth wire. I got the doorbell button and the buzzer. And the cool thing about that there there is that Scorsese signed it for me. Oh, he signed it. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, that's cool. So that's, that's like movie history. My prized possession now. Uh, yeah, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <ooh. laughs> um, and um, just more found props, I think pretty um, prominently towards the end, right before Scorsese's cameo, actually. Um, yeah. I'm typing on this typewriter, which is, I'm also a typewriter collector. So convenient yes, there. Of course. Um, yeah. so I used my typewriter, um, for that and, um, we filmed it in two days and, um, it was Jack very, White. I mean, it's another story there. I, 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 I didn't know he was Jack White at first. I was talking to him like, Oh, you're a musician. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Jack White. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I recommend people see this movie. It is like three and a half hours long uh, without going. I'm sure it'll be on HBO at some point soon um, or, or whatever. Apple, I, I, my wife rented it and paid for it, which it's, you know, January, the- January 12th, 2024. It'll be streaming on Apple TV. Okay, yeah. good. All right. Now I'm angry at my <laughs> wife for paying $20 to rent the movie uh, that'll be out in eight days. But um, no, I'm kidding. Sorry. But um, the portion you're in 
for folks who haven't seen it, is very different from the entire movie. It has nothing to do really. I mean, it explains it and it talks about it, it's related to it, but but like the setting and everything is totally different from the rest of the movie. So I was kind of mm-hmm. just like I kept being because I knew Paul was in it. Wells before you were in it. I was like, where is Paul? <laughs> and, then, and then I and I remember also then like that day or the day before seeing that you were in it. And I was like, oh, my God, I know two guys in it. Where are they? Yeah. It was like three hours. I was like, where are they? And then yeah. it's like, boom, the whole ending. It's, it's just this cool like sequence. It's yeah. Oklahoma for like three hours and 15 minutes. And you're wondering, when is a New York City radio studio going to factor into Oklahoma here? And yeah. um, it's a very, it uh, very brave and, and uh, sudden move. But it's kind of what makes exciting filmmaking is to do yeah. kind of swing swing for the fences type of move um i remember the first time i saw it in theaters i knew that some scene with me was coming but i didn't know exactly how but as yeah. soon as i knew the end of the movie was coming my heart just started pounding out of my chest which had never <laughs> happened when i was in an amc before my heart yeah, yeah, was just yeah. pounding out of my chest because i knew like i'm finally gonna get to see this after by the way two and a half years <laughs> That's true. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It, Man. It, you know, when, at least when you bake a cake, you get to see it an hour later. You know, this is two and a half <laughs> years later. It was one of the oh longest God. post-productions for any Scorsese film ever. Um, I'm not a film expert, but I've read a lot about it. Um, the ending is meant to um, kind of break, um, break from reality a little bit, be a little bit surrealistic. And um, it has some anachronisms in it. Like, for example, it describes somebody's death in the 60s, but we're in the 30s telling you that somebody died in the the 60s. So it's intentionally uh, surrealistic in that way. And the purpose of being surreal in that moment, and for Scorsese himself to come up and tell you, is that he's supposed to tell you that, you know, I'm, um, I'm responsible here for just telling a tragic story with you know actors and makeup you know this is all fake these are just actors and makeup and we're uh, sensationalizing tragedy for entertainment and they did it back then with old radio shows and we're doing it right now and so it's just very real moment of like you know um you know this is all this is all fake this is all fake yeah but the tragedy is real and um um, yeah, I think it was a very yeah. beautiful way to end the movie. And, um, I would agree. And I don't think in any way, shape or form, what we are talking about now spoils or ruins the movie. Like we said, the movie is completely different, different yeah. than this end sequence yeah. that, that just kind of comes out of nowhere in a good way, but watch it, enjoy the movie, then know that. Nick is over on one side of the stage and then Paul from the Neil Peart series, um, the Tony Williams series on here is in the back on the drum set. Um, and it just feels different to be like, Oh, I know those guys, which has never (laughs) happened with a Martin Scorsese movie to me. Um, I should mention though, if any, you know, there might be people listening who have, who've been a drummer in a movie or in a scene. Uh, they always make you, you know, fake, fake it. And in that scene, when you're watching, you can, kind of be um, informed that um, the orchestra had pre-recorded that. And so they, they are fake playing a little bit. Paul plays the timpani like really convincingly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the cool thing with the sound effects is they had these um, antique ribbon microphones that they had rented and that were functioning and, and restored. And they told me that, you know, this microphone on your table is a functioning microphone. So when you, when you play your drum, you know, lean into the microphone because it's a real microphone. Yeah. And um, they had like really amazing uh, sound experts, a lot of which had just finished making Spielberg's West Side Story, who were uh, leveling the vintage microphones because they genuinely wanted a vintage sound, which is so cool. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. And then to, to pick up other instruments, they were taping microphones behind my table taping microphones behind my instruments just like hiding microphones everywhere wow and so 
with the exception of uh, this Chinese Tom Tom, which I had to fake play. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of how close I can get to that head without, without <laughs> like hitting it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was proud yeah. of that. I was like, it's not going to look like, like this, <laughs> like some yeah, movies. And, or you're like completely <laughs> missing. Yeah. yeah. Um, with the exception of this Tom Tom, they recorded everything as it was realistically on that stage. It was just like the ultimate authentic, cool touch. And hopefully for people hearing this, um, they can appreciate it more knowing these fun details. And, uh, um, totally. there's even a couple, uh, magazine reviews that mention sound effects. And, uh, I think variety magazine called me, uh, did it didn't describe me? They called my sound effects, uh, goofy. I think another review called it cheesy sound effects, but I think, I think that was supposed to be the intended feeling of, of kind of a radio shows back then, like just kind of enter turning, turning a tragedy yes. into a, a cheap entertainment. Yeah. yeah. Well, now you're a celebrity in the public eye. You got to let it roll off your back. The tabloids <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> the celebrity magazines and stuff, but um, that's awesome, man. And, and this may, this may sound cheesy to say, but I feel proud of you from someone who's been on the show, like I said, 200 episodes ago mm -hmm. to be like, you're still doing it. You're still passionate about it. You know, more than ever, you're now literally doing this in movies where you're the go-to guy. Um, so I think that's pretty amazing and something to be very proud of. Um, so, and you're, you, it's good for our community of drummers and musicians that, you know, you're kind of representing us, um, and people taking us, taking, taking drummers and trap, trap instruments and performers serious. So, uh, great job. Oh, thank you. You know, that's you. super cool. Um, awesome, Nick. Well, I think that's it, man. I think this has been an awesome episode. I think it's really unique. Back when we recorded in 2019, I wasn't on YouTube. So I'm glad to have this element of it, um, where we can see these things now. So mm -hmm. this is a really cool episode. So, um, why don't you tell people where they can find you at your website, um, social media, whatever you want to plug here at the end? Yeah. Um, I have a, uh, a website just for uh, traps and sound effects called vintage percussion sound Um, I don't have a uh, social media for sound effects, but I have a, um, a, a page just for my playing uh, xylophone and percussion called tiny dot xylophone tiny.xylophone. Um, awesome. All right, Nick. Well, I appreciate you being here. Thanks to everyone for listening and watching and, uh, hope everyone's having a great 2024 so far. And, um, that does it for this one. So thank you very much to Nick white for being here. And, uh, Nick, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for sharing all this info and the great stories and all that stuff. And, uh, we'll have you back again sometime, some other time. I'm sure. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Bart.